studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Michael Crichton is here. He is the best-selling author who has long displayed a knack for popularizing science. His most recent book, Next, explores the world of genetic research. This is a controversial issue now. Some companies actually own a disease and its specific course of treatment. This author has looked at many provocative subjects. His last work, State of Fear, examined climate change. Jurassic Park presented a spin on paleontology and DNA. And this all started with his first techno-thriller, The Andromeda Strain. The public has followed him down every path. He has written 15 best-selling novels, and 13 have been made into major motion pictures. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Tell me about Next. How did you decide, and I ask you this every time, that this was the subject that you wanted to write about? This was a very unusual experience for me because I had planned to do something else. And I was invited to a conference on genetics and law, which was a subject not in my, you know, front burner at all. And, but it was in Los Angeles, and I thought, well, you know, I'll go. And I went there and listened to the kinds of discussions that were taking place, and I kind of went, oh, my God. Um, I wasn't aware of, of any of the things, really, that were happening now in terms of, of, you know, what's being done with people's tissues, what's being done in terms of gene patenting. And I got, I got very upset. Okay, tell me what made you say, oh, my God, about gene tissues, about gene patenting. Give us the sense of the things that are real that scare you and, uh, and make you determined to change it. You just returned from Washington today mm -hmm. where you testified or met with some people mm -hmm. to get gene patenting changed. I can tell you two things. One is... People now own diseases. Hepatitis C is owned. How do you get and, to own a disease? Well, you you uh, get the genomic structure and you patent it, right. and then that's yours. And if so we're the first person to determine the genomic structure of hepatitis C, and so therefore we own it. Yeah. You know? And so if you want to do research on hepatitis C, um, if you want to test people, if if you're somebody who says, I'd like to go in and test homeless people for hepatitis C, and I'd like to do that as a... As a um, Kind of charitable contribution. There's somebody out there who'll say, "No, you can't," and they they can prevent you from doing it. So that's one. Because we found the genetic structure of hepatitis C, and so therefore they own it. We own it. It's their property. You're not allowed to test for it. You're not allowed to do research on it. You're not allowed to do anything. They own it. And it's just as if it was a piece of land that they can keep you from trespassing on. And so what happened to the idea of simply you you do science from humankind, and then you put your discovery into the well, I think there's the library, two things. So everybody can read it. Yeah, I think there's two things going on simultaneously. One is that there's an enormous uh, commercialization of, of bio biology, right. generally speaking. Everybody, and, lots of people think it's the next big thing. Biotechnology yeah, well, is the next great explosion mm -hmm. as, as computers and Internet technology was in the past. Well, I think to, to some extent that'll be true. But if you look at, say, the... the uh, the amount of money that uh, is generated by bio biotech as opposed to big pharma, you know, there's no comparison at all. The, but yes, it's certainly a, a major technology of the future, and we're all looking forward to it. The, the issues about commercialization have to do with the usual kinds of questions about uh, whether or not you're making information available. You know, I mean, you want to hire a Ph.D. candidate, very often now they can't tell you what they worked on. They have a PhD, and they say, you know, they'll tell you the general area. I did something in genomics or in proteonomics. Yeah. What exactly? They can't say. Now, this, no, this, explain. They can't say because they're in non-disclosure agreement. Okay, they right. can't say what they work okay, on. Right. Right. Um, there are, for example, no regulations concerning um, gene replacement therapy. There, there are diseases in which you're lacking a gene. There are procedures in which the gene can be put into your body. They're very risky. Um, in a few cases, they worked. In a lot of cases, they haven't. And Sometimes people have died. died. A lot of people have died. Right. Okay. You go to the universities or the groups that are doing this research and say, you know, we really think that these deaths should be reported. And they say, no, these deaths are a trade secret. No research. If, well, it's a trade secret. We own it. And, and um, you know, if we report these deaths, then the next university over will get an adv advantage because they'll know that the procedures we're doing have led to deaths. 
So this kind of enormous commercialization, the, the notion that most good university professors sit on boards or have companies of their own, biology professors, you know, is a, is a very large change over the last 20 years. That's one part of it. The, the gene patenting part of it is something both more restricted and, so, and in a way simpler. It's a mistake. The patent office made a mistake. And when you go down to talk to the people in Washington, are they responsive and do they realize that and are they going to change? They are responsive and I think they will change. There's been uh, um, Congressman Becerra, who's from Los Angeles, and uh, David Weldon, who's a physician from Florida, have both uh, jointly put a bill forth to ban gene patents in the future, and I'm very hopeful it will pass. So you come, and by the way, you have an MD from Harvard. Mm. You come, so an interest in medical, medicine and science, as we know. You come to this subject that interests you, and there's something wrong about it, you think. What do you do then, the writer? Gather stories. Stories. Let me tell you a story. Right. This is an old story. This is like the first story. 1980, a guy named John Moore. He's a construction worker on the Alaska pipeline. Gets sick. Big physical guy. Starts to lose weight. Doesn't feel good at all. Goes to his doctor. He's from the Seattle area. Doctor says, you have a very rare form of leukemia. And the only place for you to get treated is UCLA. Goes down to UCLA. Sees the expert there. The guy says, yes, we'll treat you. It's, it, it's an almost uniformly fatal illness. Has his spleen removed, had other treatments, has chemotherapy, uh, radiation, survives. A year later, he, he's going back for testing. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. One day, his doctor calls him up and says, we need you to come back for further testing. Doesn't say why. Doesn't say just... You know, something doesn't look quite look right. So now he's going back more and more often. And this goes on for a period of years. He's concerned. No one actually tells him that he's still sick, but he's worried about it. And each time he goes back, they take more tissue and more biopsies. And he has a few more forms to sign, a few more consents, a few more releases. Finally, they're getting pretty thick. Eventually, you know, he says to his doctor, you know, um, it's difficult for me to come from Seattle. Can't I do these tests up here? No, you have to come down here. Finally, he says, are you doing some commercial thing with these tissues? The doctor says, absolutely not. Guy turns around and discovers that UCLA has made a cell line of his cells, which have the characteristic of producing a, a very large quantity of anti-cancer agents. So what you do is go out and collect stories. So that's your central story right there. Then you just need one story, or you then go find stories about what goes on at universities, and and somebody else tells your story. So that this is what I, this is what I thought. I th part of what interested me was, um, you know, in the classic issues of nature and nurture. You know, what, how it, in our understanding now of our genetic material, because it's all been decoded or mostly. Right. And we really have a better understanding of how we interact with it, how it interacts with the environment. So what is the deal with nature and nurture? I mean, it's been a debate for my whole lifetime. And it turns out to be enormously complicated and right. really interesting. And I start to envision the genome as a kind of cloud that is interactive with the environment. And, and it's really interesting. Right. That, yeah. That's just my idea. No one else holds it. And part of that leads me to think, I want to do the book to be, in a way, analogous to the genome. And the genome uh, accumulates bits and pieces of genetic material over time. They get viruses, they get incorporated. Right, right. And so I start incorporating a fair number of things that are just true stories that I just stick in the book. Do you want to direct this? I mean, I read where you want to direct a movie soon. Is this one you might direct? I don't think so. You want to do something like what? Don't know. Okay. Don't but you do, you're thinking about getting back, your hands back on directing. I've always that. been thinking about it, yeah. Okay. When you, there are certain things I want to ask about in terms of testing and all of that. Uh, there is a sort of, you want to, do you, there, there's something called the, is it the Bayh-Dole Act? Bayh-Dole. What does that do? Bayh-Dole was a, was a law that was passed in 1980, and the intent of the law was to get stuff out of universities, get discoveries out, and have them become publicly available. 
So the, there was the perception that a lot of things were getting learned and found out in universities, but they weren't sort of passing the blood-brain barrier and getting right. out into the marketplace. So they said, if you discover something, you can market it, even if it's done with taxpayer funds, you can market it and, and you, the discoverer, and the university, depending on whatever arrangement you have, can keep the profits. What this has done is enormously stimulate the commercial aspect of university life. From my point of view, it's a great idea that hasn't really turned out the way anybody expected. I mean, it's, it's made, for example, uh, most recently, what universities have done. The idea was to say, okay, here are these people in the university. They're not good at business. So we want them to make the discoveries because that's what they're good at. Right. And then we want them to pass it over to people who are really good at business. All right, now, X many years later, the university is saying, you know, we'd like to maximize our profits. And one of the ways for us to do that is to do first stage drug testing on some of these drugs that we have. So they are actually getting into business. Mm -hmm. All right, so you have the people who aren't good at business now engaging in business before they pass it on to regular companies. And it's made a very commercial atmosphere in universities now. Do you have reasonable possibilities of changing these things that you think are wrong? Depends on what. I think, I think there's a good chain, chance to change gene patenting. I think there's a very good chance to get some good regulations to help people have control over their own tissues, which is a, which is a major thing. Uh, Bidol is a tough problem. I think there are ways to approach it, but universities are very strongly wedded to it, even though there are a lot of studies that show that it hasn't been enormously beneficial to universities. Did you come out of this with great optimism beyond the legalisms here but that affect lives for the possibilities of gene therapy, for the possibilities that come out of the mapping of the human genome, for the possibilities of stem cell research, all of those things that put us on the precipice of extraordinary leaps in medical results? I have an interesting answer. All right. Y the answer is yes, but not in the, in the way that most people talk. I, I don't think we're going to live forever. I don't think that that's on the horizon, and I don't think that, um, it, that... I think there's a good reason to think that we may not even extend lifespan in the next hundred years very much at all, maybe a few years. Mm. Um, I don't think we're going to have designer babies. I don't think the genome's going to let us do that. I mean, it's not, it's not a sort of pigeonhole thing where you pop one gene out and pop another one in. It doesn't work that way. It's much more complicated and very difficult. And I think... But when you can make tissue from stem cell, it can take you a long way. Yes, but that's very different from the sort of fantasy level that people are operating at. And one of the things that I concluded was that most of the discussion about where where genetic engineering, broadly speaking, will go is, is phenomenal science fiction. In the meantime, you know, the notion that we can have, for example, really personalized medicine, that we can have our genome known and the physician can look at your, your genetic map and say, these are the meds that you ought to have, these are the risks that you face in your life, these are the kinds of lifestyle changes that you might want to think about. Um, that sort of stuff is really here now, if we want it to be. And, and I think it's enormously powerful and enormously interesting. Stem cell stuff is, is you know, incredibly hot. I didn't want to go near it, really. Um, in terms of this book or yeah. in terms of... No, oh, just in, in terms book. of this book. And, yeah. and, and, and part of it is that, um, from my point of view, it's a continuation of the abortion debate, which I did in my first book decades ago, you know, so... But this just goes to the heart of the Bush objection to it, does it not? I mean, it, that doesn't go to the medical idea of the potential of stem cell. Here's, here's what... I mean, I have an odd idea about this, too, which is that I think, actually, science as a whole is enormously benefiting from the position of the Bush administration. And the reason is that I think we ought to have more sources of funding than just the NIH. And because the Bush administration has taken this restrictive position, which is which I don't approve of, yeah, um, and they took it because of, in a sense, political ramifications. 
I think. I think, too. Give them that exactly. I don't I know why they did it. But, I don't but, um, but that's, what, that's the general idea that they I looked would, at the yeah, I would political that. impact of it and said, let's try to find some way. Right. You know, we can set aside some that were already there, some stem cell lines, and, and right. then it turns out that a lot of them are contaminated. And you get lots of very smart medical people saying that, you know, it has impeded. It's inadequate. I don't, right. I don't think there's any doubt okay. about it. But what, what the consequence has been is that you have large amounts of private funding going into universities like Harvard and elsewhere in order to support this research X federal you know because the bush stuff only affected federal uh, federal dollars right. that would go to stem cell research so i think that's great and you got california has its state referendum that produced three billion dollars right i'm not so happy about that referendum but it is true it's mm. another source of funding why weren't you, you know? happy about that referendum well i think it was inappropriately sold i think it breaks california laws i think it's being managed by people who have a stake in the outcome right. this okay. is all stuff that we don't do right. if we're being really ethical but um, Bush might be uh, have one side effect, which is it would have produced new sources of revenue for researchers operating in the private domain. There's absolutely no question that's, right. that's right. already happened. On the other hand, there are doctors who are leaving the United States to go to other places like London, like Singapore, to work. Well, because yeah. Because they can have much more freedom to do the kinds of things and access to money to do the kind of research they want to do. That's not a small problem. Or is it in your judgment? You don't buy that uh, either? This is, this is an international thing, and I think that there are, depending on who you talk to, there are fewer constraints in China, you know, or, or some people would say the United States is the Wild West in terms of this, in terms of what, what your kinds of research you're able to do. I'll tell you one thing that I've noticed about the stem cell debate. If you say to somebody, are you interested in stem cells, and yes, and you understand, and they say yes, and you say, what is your image of an embryo that would be used for stem cell research? And what everybody has in their mind is a fetus. They're this little thing, you know, with the fingers wiggling and the heart beating, and that's not what it is at all. It's something that looks much closer to a soap bubble, a bunch of little yeah. clear bubbles. And, and I think that ultimately, my, my own opinion about where this is going to go. Ultimately, this debate is going to go away. And embryonic stem cells are going to prove to be so important. And the notion of tying them to a human being is going to be so difficult. Or, or they will develop some new strategy for doing this that yes. does not involve an embryo. Yes. I mean, there's a you lot of... You get stem cell tissue that you can use that didn't come from an embryo. Right. Well, there are adult stem cells now that are being used. I know, but I mean, there have been recent developments that, that, that are not just adult stem cells Correct. that suggest... Amniotic cells exactly. and, and uh, right. blood cord and all of that, yes. But, I mean, you buy into the future of that, or, I mean, that stem cell will, that has the potential? Absolutely, yes. That we believe it does. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this is the most exciting area of medicine, is it not? If you can create tissue. Tell me what's more exciting. I think that a lot of medicine is exciting. I mean, I, see, there's, I mean, maybe because I'm a science fiction writer, yeah. you know, the stuff that is very far out doesn't appeal to me. You know, because I'm, you're a science fiction writer, the stuff that's way out there doesn't appeal to you. Doesn't appeal to me. No. Why is I that? Mean, now? I'm having a hard time computing I that. I don't know. It would seem to me it would be exactly the opposite. The stuff is way out there would have great appeal to you. No, I'm much more interested in somebody being able to say, "Hey, look at this. You know, we grew an ear. So, you know." Uh, they didn't, by the way. It just looks like an ear. But um, I'm more interested in what's, what's actually taking place now. I'm more interested in how somebody makes a decision to try and do a gene transplant on somebody when the chances of them having a fulminating cancer as a result and dying. Okay, but here's what else is interesting to me about you. Are you mainly interested in the legal conflicts of things? I mean, when I think of a lot of the novels you've written, it's about some kind of conflict that involves money or law. Yes. Right? Yeah. Think about it. Yeah, that's true. Harassment. Yeah. Things no, like no, it's that. very true. Why is that? I mean, your training is in medicine, not law. I, I, I think these conflicts are inevitable. I mean, we, we have them, and I think as a society, we don't think about them very well. Mm. You know, we, I don't think that we make Good decisions. I remember when, you know, when the China syndrome came out and we had Three Mile Island and everybody decided, okay, that's it for nuclear. And I thought, hmm, okay, maybe that's it for nuclear, but I don't think it's smart to make that decision on the basis of a movie. Well, you were right then, yeah. as a matter of fact, because nuclear now has much more 
currency. Mm, it does. Around it's, the world. Right. Global warming. How about that? How about that? <laughs> you see. Well, tell me where you, what you did and how you, I know, but tell me how you came to the conclusions and have you changed your conclusions with new evidence? Mm. Just so we put on record what exactly you believed and said yeah, rather than what we think you said. What, what people are saying is really not true, even though at the end of that book I thought, well, people aren't going to understand this, so I'll write it in simple declarative sentences and still people misstate it. What I said was, the Earth is definitely getting warmer. It's gotten, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven tenths of a degree Celsius warmer in the last hundred years. We are increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's increased thirty percent in the last century. We're, we, we meaning humans, we are doing human this. beings, yes. Um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. We would expect a thirty percent increase to have some influence on temperature. We're also doing lots of other things that, that affect the, the temperature as it's measured in a, in a global temperature reading. So we're, you know, cutting down the forest and doing croplands and all of that. What's, what's basically called land use changes, or the urban heat island effect also, has an effect whether that's compensated for adequately in the way they do these calculations or not. And I said... My conclusion is that we will have a tenth of a degree warming increase in the next hundred years. So I absolutely believe that warming is occurring, humans are involved, and where it's going to continue for the next hundred years. Then what did you say that got everybody so upset at you? I'm not a catastrophist. And oh, I said one other thing too. I said I think it is not likely that carbon dioxide is going to prove to be the primary driver. What, what do you think will be the primary driver? I think the sun, and I think there are miscalculations from urban land use, generally speaking. Okay. Now, you know, and I'm sure you read every sentence of this new report by the U.N. that came out of Paris. Hmm. Yes? I, I haven't, actually, because I don't read the summary for policymakers. <laughs> I, wonder, I read what the scientists say, not what the politicians say. Tell me if I'm wrong. Every good scientist that I talk to says to me, 90% of the scientists agree on this. I don't know what the percentage is, but I would... I mean, you, it's, it's the lone exception out there. And everybody says you ought to listen to them, and we do, and I've talked to them. But most of the scientists say we all agree on this, you know, that it is catastrophic, catastrophic. Uh, that, in fact, if the ice sheet melts... But, no, but, the but Charlie, that's melts, not true. If they don't it, say that. They, wait, I mean, scientists don't say that? Not everybody. And, no, I didn't and, say everybody. I said mo the scientists say to me the majority of us agree with this. We agree that if, in fact, nothing is done, nothing is done about carbon dioxide in the air, carbon in the air, that, in fact, uh, you're going to have these incredible things that we can be see the beginnings of now in which the ice sheet melts and, and it affects the weather and everything else. Tell me what's wrong about this. Oh, I know. You're bored by this or what? Well, it's... it's um, A lot of the people who talk about it, and I don't, I don't know who you're thinking of specifically, don't actually know very much. And, and I'm sympathetic to that because for a long time I said, oh, yes, carbon, you know, global warming, it's a terrible problem, blah, blah, blah. And only when I went and looked at the figures, I thought, wait a minute. Tell me again why this is a catastrophe. I see that it's something that's happening. Mm -hmm. I see that it's important. If you talk to Jesse Osabel at Rockefeller University, he'll tell you we've been decarbonizing since the days of Abraham Lincoln and Queen Elizabeth, and we're going to continue to decarbonize. So whether or not we're, this is going to happen fast enough for some people, it's a long-term 150-year trend. It's going to continue. The, you can't get agreement on almost anything, as far as I can tell. I mean, you can, you can bring in five guys to talk about whether Antarctica the core of Antarctica is getting colder or not. Everybody agrees the peninsula, which is 2% of the mass, is getting warmer. And, you know, they'll argue and argue and argue, and you'll come away after an hour saying, I don't know what the answer is, and that's the reality. Nobody really knows that. But what I said in my book, and I think, and I defy anybody to tell me I'm wrong, is I said nobody knows how fast it's going to get warmer, 
and nobody knows for sure what the various contributions of warming are. And I've predicted eight tenths of a degree, and nobody knows that I'm wrong. And nothing has happened since you wrote that book to change your mind about your conclusions. No. No. And what I do, you know, I've had a really, I went to Germany in, in 05, and, and it was a very hostile environment, and I, and I gave a speech which consisted only of what was then the, the latest UN document, the third assessment report, and I put these graphs up, and I said to them, look, this is what they're saying, is this okay with you? The audience got phenomenally silent. Because if you really start to say, okay, how do you validate the models? How is it done? Oh, we do it. Um, there's a uh, personal component of assessment. Well, really? You know, well, that's not okay for a drug. That's not, it's not okay for the maker to, to self-validate. We don't believe that. We don't think that's acceptable. It has to be done by somebody outside. We're talking about, if you listen to Bjorn Lomborg, $558 trillion globally to make this change. I think it's a, a good change to make. I think we will make it naturally. I think there's a lot of reasons to make it. I'm in favor of making it. The question is whether we should do it as a crash program for $558 trillion. And the notion of spending that money without really validating the bejesus out of the data is very bizarre to me. I mean, let me give you, let, let me put it to you this way. If global warming was a company, you couldn't buy it because they won't let you do due diligence. They won't let you look at the figures. They being? The scientists who do the, the um, global mean. OK, but let, let me ask this question. Yeah. Do you disagree with the idea that the majority of scientists who are experts in this area have a different conclusion than you? I don't know the answer to that, and I'll tell you why. Um, Hans von Storch does a, a poll of scientists every few years. And he asked them uh, in 2003, so it's a while ago now, he said, are you totally convinced that human beings are, are the primary cause of the warming that you see? Are you largely convinced? Are you somewhat convinced? It was one of those right, five. Right, right. This is, came out of the UN report, too, those kind of words. Right. But, but he asked people to really do it, and, and it's a, um, it's a you know, secret ballot. The number of people who were totally convinced, as opposed to largely convinced or partially convinced, I, I was very surprised. It was 9.4%. Only 9% of the people are totally convinced. Yeah, under 10. What about, um, what's the next step up then? Totally convinced to... Oh, the majority are, 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 are believe that this is... Convinced, but not totally convinced. Or it's likely, but not... Let's, let's move a little bit. What are you going to do about it? Ah, that, the UN people said, I mean, I, I find it a little bit difficult to have a conversation. I mean, I don't mean to conversation with you. I find it easy to have a conversation with you. To, but to talk, when you dismiss the UN people and all that what they're getting... Mean, these are bureaucrats. I'm interested in what the well, scientists were, say. Okay, but they, I mean, they, that's not true, Michael. They yes, weren't just is. bureaucrats. Yes, I mean, it is. You, the scientists didn't come and testify? No, scientists no, no, weren't no. involved in the publication of that at all? Scientists had nothing no, to do with that report? I don't think so. I think so. Really? I do. Maybe only a few heads of the, the various sections, but, but the reality is you have to go and look at the, at the scientific basis, that report, which will be 700-odd pages, and if you compare... For example, the 2001 paper, if you compare the summary for policymakers with what is said in the third assessment report, it bears very little relationship. It's far more confident. It has almost no detail about why somebody would say, hmm, wait a minute. There are reasons to say, hmm, wait a minute. Now, do you have a reason to why you think that, that the perception of this is not as bad as it is. I mean, in other words, you believe it's not as bad as it is. Based on your reading of the data, you think, yes, we're getting warmer, but it's not going to lead to the catastrophe. That's what you just right. said. Right. You know, do you have a reason that that's not the common perception? That it is going to lead to a catastrophe unless we do something. Unless we do something about the amount of fossil fuel right. we put in the air. Unless okay. we have some kind of carbon index. Unless we get serious about this, it is going to be a catastrophe. Okay. First thing I want to say to you is, I'm not stopping anybody from doing any of this. Right. And I don't want to be blamed 
<laughs> yes, I know. for the notion that, you know, the Congress isn't going to pass the Kyoto Protocol right. or something like that. Um, but I think the answer is that whenever you have something that's untied to the data, and when you have people adopting essentially philosophical positions, emotional positions, which the environment tremendously invites, uh, how I feel as I walk through the woods and how I feel as I see clear-cutting or something like that, um, very often from people who really don't understand these issues at all, then it's a very easy thing for an attitude to move in the direction of increasing demand or in increasing hysteria or increasing concern, whether or not that's appropriate or not. And, and you can see these movements take over science. You know, when I was a young person, every project, the, every grant proposal had to be to cure cancer because it was Lyndon Johnson's war right, on cancer. Right, and right. there was no point. I mean, if you wanted to propose something, you had to find a way to say, well, this is going to help cure cancer, true or not. Rather than diabetes or something else. Right. I mean, you couldn't just be doing basic research. Right. So I understand that, that, you know, these ideas can take hold, and I understand that, generally speaking, the more extreme elements will, will push that, and the media is not interested in a balanced perspective. I am. Okay. But you're very rare. Well, just, and that's the truth. Yeah. Well, Al Gore. I like him very much. What He's do you wrong think of on his this movie? issue. He's wrong? He's wrong on this issue. That's my opinion. How is he wrong? I like him a lot. I'm very fond of him. Yeah. Um, Wish he'd been president. He's done some things. Wish yeah. he'd been president? Yes, he's done some things. Was that a yes to wish he'd been president? I don't look back. Oh, that's a cop out. It's not. I don't know how. I don't know how. Given what we Would you know rather have seen happened, George Bush or Al Gore elected when they ran against each other in the year 2000? I like Al Gore. Okay. It's, you know, it's just nothing to be gained by trying to say yes or no. I like him a lot. Okay. I hear you. And respect his intelligence, respect his commitment to this issue, yes. respect the book he wrote on the earth, the globe, whatever it was. Yes? Yes. Now he's made a movie. Yes. Inconvenient Truth. Yes. And you say about what he says in that movie, what? If I wanted to make a movie that said that, that said what he said, I could make a much better movie. There are a lot of things in that movie that are dicey and that are, and there's a lot that's Okay, but let's just tell me what there not, is in that movie that's not dicey, but wrong. Okay. Um, Kilimanjaro, as an example of global warming, is wrong. 20-foot increase in sea levels or 40-foot increases, whatever it is now, is wrong. And... And I think, actually, attitudinally, it's wrong. I think that, you know, the notion that this is a, that this is a spiritual or religious issue for us is wrong. It is a scientific matter that we need to look at with as dispassionate a way of seeing it as possible. And... If we don't do that, we're just expressing rank prejudices. As so Al Gore's movie and book express rank prejudices. That's my view, sure. I mean, he's, he's making arguments. I mean, I love the guy. He's making arguments that, for which there is no data. There just isn't. And he's got these fabulous pictures of, of the United States being inundated and... You know, and I had somebody call me up who's seen it and said, wow, you know, I know you live at the beach sometimes, and I have a beach house, and, you know, kiss them goodbye. I don't think so. You know, the U.N., and the, by the way, the new U.N. report, which you're so fond of, says 38-centimeter increase. Well, 38 centimeters is a foot? Uh, what? Fond of, but not be the way I would characterize what I said. <laughs> I just said that I think they Put listen to scientists. Uh, that the U.N. report was based on uh, conversations looking at scientific data. Charlie, and the scientists the, were involved. That's all I was thinking. Here's the way, here's the way to think about this. It actually. was on the front page of the... I mean, every paper in the world had it huge on the front for, page. For weeks in advance. Yeah. Okay, question number one. You've, you've released the summary. You don't like the U.N. report? You don't like Al Gore's report? You don't like anybody who doesn't come to the conclusion? I don't mean personally. 
You because you think they're intellectually wrong. No, no, I do. Yes, I you do. think they're intellectually wrong. I do. You don't think they've looked at the data, and you think they exaggerate I, the consequences of global warming. Somebody asked me the difference between me and Al, because, and, I, and I've wondered about it too. But I think he relies on on the expert witness, and I don't. I don't. I didn't talk to anybody. You do the work yourself. Yes. And you don't think he does the work himself. No, you don't think I, he's. I don't think he goes and looks at the data. Okay. I do not, and I don't think he makes his own grass. And I don't. You know, I talked to two people, both very eminent, um, when I was working on the book, and both, you know, they both attacked me subsequently, um, because they were the leading people thinking about this. And I went to them and said, "These are my problems," and I didn't get good answers back. But Charlie, the 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 shortest version of this that I have is, I said, "Okay, we've had half a degree or six tenths of a degree. It's not a crisis. What?" Is everyone upset about it? And the answer is, we're upset about the future. How do you know, because I believe the future is unknowable, how do you know what this is going to be? And their answer is, we have a computer model of global climate. And I say, climate, according to the last UN report, is a coupled, nonlinear, chaotic system. And they say, long-term prediction of climate is not possible. That's what they say. Direct quote. So, I'm saying I don't think that a computer model cuts it. I'm not having it. Think about what I've done here in this conversation. I said, tell me exactly what it is you believe and why you believe it, and what do you say to those people who, who have a different opinion? And you said they haven't looked at the data those, as well as I have, and understand what I'm saying. Most I'm people saying, I know haven't looked at know, the data at all. Al Gore being an example of that. Well, I, don't, I don't know whether he has or hasn't, okay. but that's my sense of what he's done. And you think that the reason it's gotten such, I mean, it is now, in the opinion of many, has reached a critical mass, this judgment that it's more severe than right. you think it is, right. is because it has a certain what, certain, why does it have such currency? Well, first of all, people are... What is the way about America works that gives always, it such it's currency? It's not America, it's, it's human beings. They line up for the catastrophe. They're ready for it. They're ready for overpopulation. They're ready for resource depletion. They're ready for whatever it is. They're, we're ready for bird flu. I mean, you know, it's going to wipe well, us out. bird flu is not a problem either? It's a potential problem. Could be a very serious problem. Yes, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, people are, are they're ready. They're excited. They're excited about May account. The, I think it's far, for example, I've done this as a sort of test. Sit down at a dinner party and you say, the world is coming to an end. We have the most horrible things. It's about, and you get immediately the aroused attention of the table. Alternatively, you say, you know what? Basically, everything's good. Uh, the world's getting better. Nobody cares. No, they get they get angry, or they turn away. It's not what we want to hear. We want to hear disaster. But isn't that true about writing books and also making movies? Yeah. The, the terrorist threat is crisis. What sells crisis, tension, drama. Well, that's what you write, is it not? Mm, I mean, you're saying about it. It's terrible. A man has this rare, rare cancer, and he has, has a certain kind of mechanism within his cell structure that enables him to combat it. And somebody comes along and owns it. I know, but you don't want to read a story that doesn't have a story. No, or that doesn't have life and death. Yeah. You know, doesn't or somebody will lose their life. Doesn't have or, consequences. Or face the consequence of losing right. their life. Did you have? I mean, you know how much I like you. You know, we've had more good conversations here than anybody has. Did you have trepidation about doing this? Because I think you're wrong, but I don't know. So therefore, I can't prove it. Yeah, I did. You know, I didn't want trepidation to. Trepidation is saying, why do, why do I, Michael Crichton, need to go here? Uh, I mean, just keep my opinions to myself. I, I did. I didn't want to write it. I decided I wouldn't write it. I had breakfast with a friend of mine, a scientist who I hadn't seen in 30 years, and I told him my dilemma. And he said, no, no, you have to write it. I said, I'm going to get killed for this. He said, no, you have to write it. I would like to be able to say that as a result of that conversation, I decided to write it. I didn't. I went home and I thought, you know what, I'm not writing this. I'm just, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, as you said, keep my opinion to myself. I started to work on something else and I felt like a coward. Mm. And I thought, what are you going to do? You have looked at the data and you really believe that it's, it's an effect, but not something that the, and that the, that the, that we as human beings should be worrying about lots and lots of other things. I mean, in a sense, I'm taking the Bjorn Lomborg position. It's low on the totem pole. We ought to be taking care of disease. We ought to be taking care of world hunger. We ought to be taking care of a lot of things before we do this. 
And Before we spend money on global warming, is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah. Right. But, but you're not arguing that we shouldn't reduce our, the amount of fuel, fossil fuel we put in the atmosphere. No, I think I mean, we you, you, you'd be happy with, with tougher we, standards on auto emissions and all of that stuff. We should have done it decades ago. Yeah, so you're, anything you can do, you're in... I, I was in favor of a carbon tax 25 years ago, you know? I mean, it, it's a very logical thing to do. Still waiting for it, but you know. Yeah, but so in other words, you, I mean, there, you, you have no invested interest in being opposed to this. And in fact, most of the things that people want to do to restrict it, you're in favor of. Yeah, I want an, I want an environment that's great. I don't think this is as important a problem as other people do. That's the essence of it. That's the bottom line. All right. Suppose. Suppose it's as serious as they think it is. I mean, why? Okay. I want to get you to come back here with a scientist. Sure. Would you do that? Sure. You give me your promise. You'll come back. Absolutely. If it's a rep, a, a very good scientist who says Michael is full of, he, no, no, this is what they'll say. There's the scientist will come back and say Michael has read the data wrong, and here's why I believe. You know, what would be interesting is if you could if you could put up graphs. Well, we can do that. Yeah. Technology yeah. is wonderful. That would be a good thing to do. All right. Let me talk about some other things about you. Okay. Uh, uh, so, Jasper Johns has a big new show in Washington. Show. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful He's, show. Is he good? Oh, it's extraordinary. Is he the greatest living artist today? I think so, yes. I mean, you can, you can talk about whether it's him or Bob Rauschenberg, but... Um, but one of the things that I thought this show, this, this is a show of the first 10 years right, of his work. Right, it's very right, focused. Right. And there are people who feel that, you know, Jasper has been oversold or that, that you know, it's, um, that, that it's too intellectual or whatever people say about it. And just to, to see the work now, um, so many years later, it's extraordinary. There are other people who it's think that, that Andy Warhol got some of the credit that belonged to Jasper. I don't know how to respond to that. You don't? I don't. No, I don't know. I don't know how to balance, you know, the, Andy shouldn't have gotten this credit. And, you know, a Andy did all kinds of things that Jasper didn't. I mean, Where would you put Andy then? It's interesting that Andy seems to be way more important now than he was in his life. That often happens. <laughs> that we it thought about Van Gogh. It often doesn't, you know. <laughs> uh, 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 but I think that people perceived Andy as important in, while he was alive. But I don't think that they saw him in the same way. I think things like the Internet have made us more aware of the replication of images and, mm -hmm. and no, things I agree, that, I agree. Yeah. That, that so he's more important now than he was when he was alive. Yeah. Or more more. So then with the value of that kind of hindsight, what do you say about the contribution of Andy Warhol? I always thought it was terrific. Uh, but one of the major figures of the second half of the 20th century. Yeah, no question. Right up there with Jasper and Bob... And others. And Bob, yeah. <clears throat> what do you think of Lucian Freud? Like him a lot. I do too. It's very hard to. It's very hard. You know, I. I, I but sometimes people will say, you know, your five best or your, yeah. your ten worst. I. I don't know how to. You don't rank, like list. I don't know how to rank things. Yeah. Look at the. You're. You're. Close to. You're. You. You're over sixty. Yes. Right. Sixty-four. Oh, Sixty-four. Beatles song. It is a great Beatles song, yeah. The um, McCartney song. Mm -hmm. McCartney wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? What are your goals? What is it that you want to do? You've made a gazillion dollars. Uh, you, you, you're the only person I know who, at the same, <laughs> same time, has had the number one TV show, the number one movie, and the number one book. So, what are you reaching for? I haven't decided that. I know that's a funny thing to say, but, um, you know, a, a lot of what I do, I've concluded, has to do with um, having a new experience. Mm. You know, I testified f um, in front of the Senate, which I found to be just a, a, a very, very actually unpleasant experience. I thought it might be, but it, and it was. It was, I'd been warned. The, but I was really interested to do it. I never Me want to too. do it again, yeah. but, you yeah. know. Now, what's so unsatisfying about testifying before the Senate? Oh, it's, it's, it's all like, for show rather all, than for yeah, real? It's, yeah, it's like a Stalinist show trial. It's not, you know, no one listens to So they to beat you. up on you about, what was this about global warming? Mm. And they just beat up on you. You also went down and met with the president on that. Did you know? I did. Well, well I, I was asked to come and see him. 
And what did he want to know? He wanted just to 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 sort of say hello, and I signed some books. And oh, that, I mean, I thought maybe he was curious and said, "Michael, when everybody else seems to be going the other way, you are here and tell me why. What do you, what have you discovered?" I mean, there was a genuine curiosity about what you thought about global warming. I think that he was interested in trying to um, present his point of view, and he was since I had that point of view too. He was saying what. You know, how, how do you think about getting people to understand the other point of view? And I said, I don't really have any idea, which is true. I still don't. But the whole thing has moved now. To the but, you know, one, one of the things I wanted to say to you is that but I'm often asked the question in the U.S., which is everyone disagrees with you. And it's actually something that um, Einstein was asked. What about relativity or what? No, I mean he was. <laughs> <What's> when <laughs> no uh, one agrees with you. At all. a certain point, um, the the Nazis had made this book of uh, because it was Jewish science, and and two hundred scientists had said that Einstein was wrong about relativity. Mm. And somebody asked Einstein, "What do you what do you think?" There are two hundred people that say you're wrong, and he said, "All it takes is one person to prove me wrong." You see, consensus science is not science. Consent, all this consensus stuff is about politics. The real question is what is about the science, and that's why you know I said, for example, if you got a good model, run it out okay, ten but, years and let's see you show it. Okay, fair enough. I mean, I don't think anybody's saying this is going to happen in ten years. So, I mean, no, but I'm saying if your model is good for a hundred years, let's see it run for ten. Okay. Tell me what the temperature. Suppose they would turn around and say, "Okay, Michael, you prove we're wrong. Did you prove they're wrong in your judgment?" No, no one can prove it wrong. We're talking about what the future is. No one knows what the future is. Charlie, I have to tell you, if there's anything that's so weird for me, yeah. it's this, that, that you can talk to scientists and you say, what do you think of that shop corner with a neon sign that says psychic reading and somebody's going to tell you the future? And they go, oh, that's a fraud. That's a charlatan. No one can do that. You go, great. What do you think about the, telling me what the global temperature of the climate, I predict the climate, no one can predict the weather for a month, the climate, a hundred years from now, and they go, oh, that's, that's science, that's important. Pay $500 million for that, a billion dollars. I mean, it's bizarre to me. No one can predict the future. What's your biggest regret about all the things you have done? Wow, what a question. I, you know, it's, it's a funny... I've done things that have been very difficult for me, like this book that we're talking about. I think it's a sort of function of personality. I, I tend not to regret. You know, it's, it's, I did it, right or wrong. I mean, I, I think there's going to be really interesting. The, the guy that I think you ought to get on this show is a guy named Reed Bryson who was the leading climatologist of the 1970s and became very heavily committed in global cooling, predicted millions dead and so on. He's still around. He's still writing and commenting. And I think he's had the experience of having made a mistake. And if I'm right, mm. then there's going to be enormously fascinating history because there's a whole band of intelligentsia and a whole band of scientists that I'm going to turn out to have made a significant major mistake. I actually look at it in terms of where we're going. I mean, is, if this doesn't work out, then science itself is going to be enormously injured. Are we, as Western societies, moving away from science? Are we having less and less interest in verified data? I mean, I, I start talking about verified data and people kind of, mm, they seem uninterested in that. They seem uninterested in having real certainty about things and more interested in this sort of cohesiveness and consensus idea. Maybe we're moving in some other direction. Do you think, why do you want to go back and direct movies again? I don't know. Now that we talk about it, maybe I don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you thinking about doing something on global warming as a movie? No. 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 You want to do some action adventure thriller, don't you, or not? I actually don't. I mean, I don't... You want to do what? Some quiet, small, mm -hmm. character-driven film? Mm-hmm. About marriage and divorce and... All the things I know so well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the things you've been so That's successful right. at. That's <laughs> right. Real experience. <laughs> no, but I mean, what... 
of all the things you have done, what has brought you the most? Psychic income satisfaction. Mm. Whatever is really difficult. Really? The more difficult, the more pleasure. Yeah, more sad. I mean, it was very difficult for me to do a book 20 years ago called Travels that was right. because it was about myself. And I don't right. like, didn't like yeah. to talk about myself. I liked it, actually. Yeah, thank you. And I'm trying to do another one. And, um, and I'm actually, I mean, it sounds perverse to many people, but I'm proud of having done the book about global warming. I mean, because if you listen I to this knew, conversation, you I have to be I knew everybody was going to be against me, and I thought, this is what I believe, and I'm sorry, and I said it. And I did it, and I've taken just flack for it. But you know what? It is what I believe. And, and, and you're proud the, that you did it because of you, you, you went into a rough seas. Very rough seas. And nasty and personal and brutal and unfair and mean. Well, what was nasty, unending. brutal, unfair, and mean? Oh, Charlie, this is, I mean, you, you want to look at what people say. For example, when I started talking about genetics, people said, well, you know, you might get some criticism for this. Well, I haven't gotten any criticism for genetics, let me tell you. I mean, you know, I know what criticism is. But I, I've had the experience of having had books in print for 40 years. So I can go back and look at the stand that I took in favor of abortion when I was a medical student in Boston in 1967, six years before Roe v. Wade, and I can look at that and go, was I right or not? And I think, damn it, I was right. And I'm imagining when I wrote this book, when I wrote The, the um, State of Fear, I was imagining what's it going to look like in 40 years? I think I'm going to come out just fine. It's great to have you on the show, as always. Um, this new book, which is all about the subject we talked about at the beginning, is called Next. Next. Uh, it is an extraordinary story. One last quick question about that, because we've done so many programs about it. Do you believe, as we began to map all the genomes and all of that, we will find out <coughs> two things. One is that there are greater or lesser differences between the species, chimpanzees and humans, for example. Uh, secondly, do you think we'll find that, there were, that, that nature nur nurture or that environment versus genetic is more parallel, more, have more parity than we imagined? I think for sure more parity and more, uh, more interactivity. Yeah. And in terms of the, the, um, the humans, species. the species differences, I think I think to do raw numbers of genes is probably very misleading, you know. Um, I mean, there's supposedly something like 450 genes that separate us from chimpanzees. Right. But I don't think that really means anything, exactly. I think. As always, thank you. Michael Crichton, the book is called Next. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.